Hey everybody, and Tony here with my review of Bizet's Carmen, which I saw at the Staatsoper Unter den Linden. The conductor was Bertrand Dubilly. The production was done by Martin Kuschai. The assistant director was Herbert Stöger. The sets were done by Jens Kilian. The costumes were done by Heidi Hackel. The lights were done by Reinhard Traub. And the chorus master was Martin Wright. Let me preface this by saying that I am not a huge fan of Martin Kuschai's productions, as they leave me cold and I find them lacking in vibrance, life, and color. Given my experiences of watching his productions of Die Zauberflöte, Elektra, and of course Carmen, I was left absolutely cold, uninterested, and just plain frigid at what he had to offer in terms of his icy looking sets and just set designs that leave a lot to be desired and directions that seem rather questionable. My main reason for checking out this production of Carmen at the Staatsoper Unter den Linden was to see and hear Gael Arquez and Stanislas du Barberac sing the roles of Carmen and Don Jose respectively. I will gladly talk about them much later in this review, but first, my thoughts on the production. As I stated before, this production of Carmen was rigid, cold, and devoid of almost any other color other than gray, some black, and a lot of garish white, especially in the fourth act. I really do miss that sunny, vibrant, colorful, and vivacious feel of Seville as written by not only Bizet, but also by the likes of Ludovic Alevi, and especially inspired by Prosper Merimé's novella of the same name. What we get is some architecture, especially in the first act where it's slanted, a, so a sort of fountain in the second act, some semblances of hills in the third act, and basically an empty stage that's garishly lit in the fourth act. And let's also not forget that Frasquita and Mercedes are made to look more like prostitutes than gypsy girls, given the skimpy clothing that they wear. There are some interesting yet shocking directions that this production took. It's not just Carmen who ends up dead in the end, but also in the beginning, Don José gets executed. Micaela in the first act sees Don Jose's dead body after Morales ordered his soldiers to execute him, and she lays alongside him. Zuniga ends up being stabbed by Don Jose in the second act. Micaela ends up being shot by Don Jose in the third act. And Escamillo ends up being killed in the bullfighting ring before Don Jose ends up being executed. So with Zuniga's death, this is not the only occasion in which he ends up six feet under. But with Micaela, it's kind of a surprise and kind of not a surprise because she doesn't appear in the fourth act and she does have her last contribution in the third act in which she reminds Don Jose that his mother is dying and he needs to return to her. Here in this production, she ends up being shot and she suffers from her gunshot wound and ends up dying in Don Jose's arms as if to show that her purpose was not only served, but he also killed her out of his blind love for Carmen, even though he might have acted on his duties of keeping trespassers away, and should anybody trespass, they'll end up being bitten by the bullet. Then there was also the way Carmen died in front of a crowd of people wearing white. It's as if they were messengers of death, let alone heralds of death, witnessing her ultimate fate at Don Jose's Hands. And even though these messengers of death came for Escamillo's bullfighting event, 
the main event for these heralds was to see Carmen die. Furthermore, there were more character interactions. Rather than just having a random guide for Micaela to talk to, she ends up talking to Escamillo, which was the first and only time these two pivotal characters interacted with each other, other than just having Escamillo interact with Carmen, Mercedes, Frasquita, Remandado, Don Cahil, and Zuniga. This is also to show that, yes, Escamillo knows these people and has first-hand experience with them and is not afraid to tell Micaela the whole truth and nothing but the truth about these people that she's going to get herself into, let alone the situation that she might find herself in, as it is a dangerous one that she should never underestimate, thus making the chances of her escaping really slight. Another character interaction worth mentioning was the dialogue between Morales, Mercedes, and Frasquita as they were expounding what happened to Don Jose during his time with his mother, who was passing away, and he has just returned to the bullfighting arena to have his revenge on Carmen. And he is still in hot pursuit by the Dragoons who have a case on him for not only murdering Zuniga, but also Micaela. So it's just exposition that Morales and his men are in hot pursuit of Don Jose. Equally worth mentioning about this production of Carmen was the usage of Bizet's critical edition, which meant that there were some uncut numbers, such as the complete scene of the cigarette girls in the factory, especially since they also interact with the soldiers, as well as Escamillos and Don Jose's uncut knife fight. And I definitely would love to see and hear Carmen uncut. So even though I did not like the set designs, which were bare and frigid and were kind of lifeless, the lighting was still rather well done. And there were occasions where I did enjoy the additional character interactions. And at least there were some moments I could still still return to. So not all was completely terrible about Martin Cushay's production of Carmen, but I'm not going to return for those barren sets anytime soon. Enough with my thoughts on the production, let's get on to what I think about the singers, starting off with Gael Arquez as Carmen. I first heard her ever since I was a 21-year-old young man, and while I believed that she was rather adept in the Baroque repertoire, hearing her as Carmen left a lot to be desired. And I mean a lot but that's not to say that she was a terrible singer. The good things about Gael Arquez as Carmen was that she had a pleasant timbre. It sounds nice. It doesn't sound wobbly or troublesome. It doesn't sound too strident. And it's just pleasant all around. And she was able to act the part solidly. I really liked how she was able to use that no-nonsense approach to Carmen other than just having her being this vampish and sexy seductress of a gypsy girl. She was able to take advantage of Carmen being a no-nonsense girl who has a mind of her own and is not afraid to state that she wants to be free regardless of what people say about her and she is not going to take crap from anybody. And that's something that's quite laudable about Gail Arquez in terms of her portraying Carmen as this no-nonsense young woman. And that's something I could still give her credit to, but in terms of her voice, a pleasant timbre does not make a great Carmen. I say this because her voice lacked depth, it lacked richness, and it lacked that sufficient chestiness that I love in many a mezzo singing Carmen. When it comes to my favorite Carmens, I have in my ears Ebestignani's peerless virtuosity, Gianna Pedersini's unparalleled 
flair for drama. Elena Obrasova's superb mastery of the chest tones, especially in the card aria, En va pour éviter, specifically when she sings Repetera la mort, which needs to be chesty to show that the situation that Carmen finds herself in or is about to find herself in is no joke. It's extremely grave and this will cost her her life. Let's also not forget about Grace Bumbry's fiery attitude as Carmen, whose voice also reflected how vibrant her character was, let alone her strong will. Surely Verrett's gorgeous musicianship, thus making Carmen a truly beautiful and free-spirited woman with a mind of her own. Aurora Buades' earthy chest tones, Giulietta Simeonato's blazing tone, and even the chestiness exhibited by the likes of Chloe Elmo, Irene Minghini Cataneo, Gabriela Besanzoni, and Fanny Anitua, just to name a few. Even sopranos who sang Carmen, such as Emmy Destin, Dusolina Giannini, Rosa Poncel, Marjorie Lawrence, and Suzanne Giol, and let's also not forget about Gertrude Runga, who started out as a contralto, but then moved on to sing a lot of these dramatic soprano roles. The same thing can be said about Martha Fuchs and Martha Myrtle. They had far more chest tones than what Gael Arquez could offer. So therein lies the main problem I had with Gael Arquez's performance as Carmen. While she was able to act the part rather well, there was something completely insufficient about her voice, and that source of insufficiency came from her hollow chest tones. Yes, there were occasions in which some of the chest tones were there, but they were faint at best. And I really hope that she works on those chest tones because those are necessary for drama and really necessary to make that voice of hers come alive. Listening to her more critically, I do think that she does have a better future in the Falcon roles, such as Julietta from Le Comte of Man and Valentine from Les Huguenots. But if she still wants to stay a mezzo, she needs to continue working on those chest tones and even get some inspiration from the likes of Ebestignani and Elena Nicolai to hear how a true mezzo sounds like and never shirk on those chest tones because the chest tones really are the key to making drama come alive and they're also the key as I would argue for making Carmen a great and interesting character vocally. When all is said and done, Gael Arquez was not a terrible singer. She was decent at best, but she does really need to work on those chest tones and really strengthen her chest tones to make her voice bear a semblance of excitement. And here's hoping that she does not squander the potential she has in her growth as a singer. Stanislas du Balberac was quite surprising as Don Jose, considering the many occasions I have associated this tenor with the light lyric tenor repertoire. I say surprising because I did not expect him to project this well throughout the theater. When he sang his high notes, he did sing them with sufficient abandon. However, there were times I was rather scared for him because this was a tenor who has practically established himself singing the likes of Tamino, Belmonte, Ferrando, and Don Ottavio, just to name a few lovely roles for a lyric tenor. Hearing him as Don Jose, I was fearful for him because I was scared that he was going to blow his voice out. And if you know me, I prefer it when either a spinto or a dramatic tenor sings Don Jose. Voices such as Aureliano Pertile, Mario del Monaco, Franco Corelli, Helgeros Venga, Rudolf Schock, 
Roger Aubin, and Giovanni Martinelli, just to name a few. That is just how high my expectations are for any spinto slash dramatic tenor singing Don José. With Stanislas de Barberac, yes, he sang well. He was able to sing with abandon, but it's not a tenor voice that I would love to have as Don Jose. Mr. de Babac's voice was good. I did not hear any wobbles. There was no signs of wear and tear. But my advice for him is just to really take care of his lyric tenor voice because he does have a naturally beautiful voice that can be suited for the right repertoire. Therefore, Stanislas du Barbarak is better off sticking with Tamino, Belmonte, Ferrando, Nadir, Milio, Wilhelmeister from Mignon, Gerald from Delibes Lacme, Ruggero Lestuc from Puccini's La Rondine, Alfredo Gemont from La Traviata, Matteo from Arabella, and Daoud from the Egetische Helena. Just stick to those lyric tenor roles and leave Don Jose for the real spinto slash dramatic tenors. All I'm saying is Stanislas du Barberac was serviceable as Don Jose and he was able to give a laudable performance that tested his limits. But he really does need to look out for his tenor voice a lot more so that it won't end up being wasted, let alone damaged from trying out such a demanding repertoire. And given his vocal resources, I would really like to see Stanislas du Balberac continue as a fine lyric tenor. And here's also hoping that he doesn't blow his voice too much with more demanding repertoire, but remain within the lyric tenor repertoire and continue making wise and conscientious choices with his repertoire. Lucio Gallo was the only veteran in this cast of singers, and I've been following his career for many years, considering that he started out with a lot of the lyric baritone roles and then built himself up in a lot of the dramatic baritone roles going from Guglielmo from Cosi Fan Tutte, all the way up to the likes of Nabucco, Falstaff, Telramond, Klingsor, Escamillo, Alfio, and many other great roles for a dramatic baritone. Listening to Signore Gallo live, I was quite impressed with how he was able to keep his strong voice intact. However, that strength was marred by wear and tear in terms of his wide vibrato, his wobble, and a semblance of a voice that could have been really great in the past, but is kind of a shadow of its former self. At least he was able to use some depth and richness in his voice, which although were slight, were still there. It's just that they were marred by some wobbles and barking and tremolos here and there and some inconsistencies that made me feel kind of sorry for him. But at the same time, I still have to give my hat off to him for at least having a voice of really decent size and what he was able to commit to as Escamillo in terms of virility as well as masculine charm, although these days he might as well stick to the likes of Simon Bocanegra, Nabucco, Falstaff, and many other father figures rather than someone as dashing and virile as Escamillo. Therefore, Lucio Gallo's voice doesn't sound as young and fresh and vibrant anymore because who I have in my ears for an ideal Escamillo who could still sound fresh even in the later parts of his career is Gian Giacomo Guelfi, who was consistent in his technique, consistent in the use of his powerful and booming dramatic baritone voice, and lest I forget about Franz Kras, who I also enjoyed as Escamillo given his velvety tone, and although he is an unpopular choice, Vladimiro Ganzaroli. So while I can give credit to Lucio Gallo 
for what he was able to deliver as Escamillo and just find himself doing more fathers and villains such as Nabucco, Simon Bocanegra, and Friedrich von Telramund. Pretty and uh, was serviceable at best as Micaela. Serviceable in the sense that she brought in dramatic flair in her acting as well as in her attitude rather than making Micaela a simple sweet country girl and throw herself at Don Jose's feet at every opportune moment. There are occasions in which her voice still had that lovely quality to it and it does project well throughout the theater but her well-projected voice is marred by inverted vibrato, tremolos, the occasional lack of chest voice, and strident high notes. Which is a shame because Pretty Yenda in her prime had a decent and really lovely instrument. I should know because I first heard her live as Comtesse Adèle de Fumetier from Rossini's Il Comptori, live from the La Scala in Milan. And her voice back then did have a nice sheen, and it did have a plushness to it that I initially liked about Pritienda. However, with every subsequent performance that she finds herself in, I noticed that her voice did show some signs of inconsistencies, some signs of wear and tear, but she was still able to keep semblances of her lyric soprano tone intact. And it's kind of a shame that these inconsistencies happen to Pritienda because I also love the character of Micaela. This is a role that I believe is so coveted by many lyric sopranos, whether they be light lyric sopranos or full lyric sopranos, let alone the occasional Spinto Sopranos. Besides, who I have in my ears as my favorite Micaelas are Gabriela Tucci, Maria Chiara, Mirella Frenni, and Adriana Maliponte, just to name a few. Oh, and lest I forget about Gianni Michaud, if we're talking about coloratura soprano singing Micaela, as well as Mieta Sigele, if we're still remaining in the line of lyric sopranos. I guess in the case of Pretty End, it's just an after effect of blowing her voice with a lot of Lucia's and coloratura soprano roles that weren't really meant for her, as she was naturally and will always be a decent lyric soprano. And I figure that roles such as Micaela and Musetta would be better fits for her voice than all of these high-flying soprano roles such as Contessa di Folleville, let alone Rossina in the soprano key from Barbieri di Siviglia. I'd say that she does have a better future with roles such as Melisande from Peleas et Melisande and even Blanche de la Fosse from Dialogue de Carmelite if she continues to keep her voice that does have potential to remain within the lyric soprano range intact. So there were vocal inconsistencies with Pretty Yendes Micaela, but the dedication that she was able to give theatrically to this peasant girl could not be equaled. I still have to give my hat off to her for at least giving Micaela some semblance of charisma in her acting. Jan Martinique may have the tall presence to make Zuniga a very intimidating and powerful character, but there were occasions where I thought that his voice lacked in depth and richness, which is also a shame because Zuniga really does need a true basso cantante slash profondo, although this role isn't as big as, let's say, Escamillo. Besides, there have been superb bossos singing Zuniga, and those include Arab Barbarian. With Jan Martinique, he was still able to use that tall stage presence of his to his advantage to make Zuniga an intimidating character, which cannot be said too much about his voice, because while it does have that nice plushness, it doesn't sound like a true basso. It sounds more like a bass baritone, which I'm really sure that he is, but at least it has good depth 
and at least it's a solid instrument that I would love to see and hear grow every single time he's on stage. So he does serviceably as Zuniga. Roman Trekel was also serviceable as Morales, although he does have that shakiness and that wobble in his voice, which really marred his vocal performance in that role. But other than that, his acting was well done. And at least in the more supporting roles of Carmen's friends, Mercedes, Frasquita, Don Cahir, and Remandado, there were definitely singers who were strong in these roles. We had Maria Hegel, who does have potential to keep on growing as a fine mezzo-soprano, embodying Mercedes and that fine and lovely timbre that she has to this particular role. Serena Sayenth making great use of her dagger-like lyric color to a soprano voice to make Frasquita a vibrant and really vivacious soul. And the definition of spitfire beauty even though there have been more substantial coloratura sopranos singing Frasquita, such as Denise Bolson, but other than that, I thought that Serena Sayev was an absolute star in this role. Yaka Mihelach using his baritone voice and his stage presence to demonstrate that Don Cahir is not one robber to be messed with as he is the boss, and he will definitely cut you if you cross his path, which Mr. Mihalach exhibited with which Mr. Mihalach exhibited with interest and sufficient virility. And the best vocal performer was Andres Moreno Garcia singing Remandado. My goodness, was his lyric tenor voice absolutely beautiful for Remandado, and he was able to take advantage of the charisma and the charm he gives to this particular character. And I also have to give major, major props to Klaus Christian Schreiber for his superb French diction as Lilia Spastia. So I was not really impressed with the singing. When it comes to my listening experience with Carmen, I want to hear exciting singers. I really want to hear singers that can put fire and passion into everything they do. And we have four main leads who do not really pull it off that well. That can be problematic. At least with Stanislas de Barbarak, I can only wish him well and really hope that he stays conscientious with his choice of repertoire because if he continues on the path of taking on roles like Don Jose and even more demanding roles that otherwise tax his lyric tenor voice, his voice might end up being gone in a few years' time. So here's hoping that he does remain conscientious, and here's also hoping that Gael Arquez continues to develop her technique in the right way if she wants to continue singing as a mezzo-soprano. As for Lucio Gallo, I think it's really high time for him to retire from Escamillo and move on to the more fatherly roles. In terms of Pretienda, she did have a nice voice in her prime, but I guess singing a whole bunch of the high-flying coloratura soprano roles did a number on whatever voice that she continued to have, as well as the timbre that even though it was still tacked and could still sound nice, was marred by inconsistencies, including an inverted vibrato. Nevertheless, there was some decent singing from the supporting roles, with the best one being Andres Moreno Garcia as Remandado. So, I'm sorry to say this, I was really not impressed with the singing, although there was some potential to be found here and there. At least the conducting done by Bertrand Dubilly was sufficiently exciting, and it was energetic in select places. There was sufficient involvement in the orchestra, although I would have loved for Bertrand Dubilly to be a lot more vibrant in his conducting, as well as tease out some small moments from the orchestra to make it more interesting. But at least in the end of the day, you can't go wrong with the chorus and the orchestra of the Staatsoper und den Linden, because they were able 
to at least strengthen the overall performance. So while I was unimpressed with the production, despite some interesting moments it had, and while I thought that the four main leads, namely Gael Arquez as Carmen, Stanislas du Barberac as Don Jose, Lucio Gallo as Escamillo, and Pretty Yende as Micaela, were problematic in varying degrees, ranging from Gael Arquez not giving a very special performance of Carmen despite her pleasing tone, Stanislas to Barbarak, who although has a beautiful lyric tenor voice, I do kind of fear that if he continues going down that path, he would end up ruining it if he's not careful. Lucio Gallo just no longer having that appeal to do these dashing roles anymore, and Pritienda showing inconsistencies in her voice despite the commitment she has. I still have to give my hat off to the supporting performers, especially Andres Moreno Garcia as Remandado, for at least making the evening somewhat enjoyable. And I still have to at least give some credit to Maestro Bertrand Duby for at least keeping the orchestra and chorus intact. I would not want to revisit this production anytime soon, unless there are more capable singers who can do justice to the roles of Carmen, Don Jose, Escamillo, and Micaela. The roles of Carmen, Don Jose, Escamillo, and Micaela are very pivotal to the opera, and when you have four main singers who are problematic at worst, it can cause issues. At least, despite the issues I had with Gael Arquez, Stanislas du Barberac, Lucio Gallo, and Pritienda, I still have to give some credit to their dedication to their crafts as singers. Although in the case of Gael Arquez and Stanislas du Barberac, I really would love to see them develop in the right way possible. And for those of you who caught Bizet's Carmen at the Staatsoper und den Linden, what'd you think of it? Did you feel like Gael Arquez and Stanislas du Barberac were overparted in the roles of Carmen and Don Jose respectively? Was there a singer you thought was the Achilles heel to the entire production? Was there a singer you particularly liked? whether it be from the mains or from the supporting roles, or was the whole experience not to your liking? Please comment below and let me know. Well, that's it for my review of Bizet's Carmen at the Staatsoper unter den Linden. Tune in next time for my review of Antichrist from the Deutsche Oper Berlin. So until then, good night everybody.